background information, we're talking about the return. The return in this case specifically relates to the fact that Brother Ian told us this morning that the people, you know, the Israelites or the Jews, when they had come from Egypt, when they had come from Egypt, you remember they got to the Red Sea, they had difficulties crossing the Red Sea. And Trevor spoke this morning about the fact that People, when they have been delivered, redeemed, come to a certain point, they think, oh, it's all done, but really not quite. So they came from Egypt. Remember, God had already spoken to um, Abraham in Genesis 15, 13, saying that, you know, I will multiply your descendants and they're going to be slaves in another country. We have a fourth generation I will remember and bring them back. That took like 400 years. Coming back, God needed a leader. Moses was chosen. And if you come to Hebrews chapter 11, you get the sense that Moses chose to suffer with the people of God rather than to stay in the palace and enjoy the beautiful things of Pharaoh's palace. That takes a lot of sacrifice. It takes someone with true leadership qualities to be able to do that. But God never brings a people out of a place without having a leader. So you tend to have Moses' qualities. When you start reading Exodus 1, he's giving so many excuses to God why he cannot perform his duties and functions. But God being so good will always make a way if it is within his redemptive plan. The interesting thing to note when you read uh, Hebrews chapter 11, it says that the people who actually came from Egypt were not the same people who moved to cross the River Jordan. That's the brother Trevor made us aware this morning. Not the same. God had to kill people for 40 years wandering in the desert because they had no faith. Sometimes we do have people around us that don't help us to move forward in the direction God wants us to. And God had to deal with these people before he frees you to be able to do something. And sometimes it can be swift, sometimes it can be delayed, other times it can take a long period of time. So if you find yourself in a situation that is so difficult, hard, challenging, and people around you are not helping you to move forward, are not helping you to increase your faith, then there must be something wrong in there. I had an elder who was in Ghana, and he used to be a Sunday school teacher, and he said, if you've actually been walking with God diligently, faithfully, for 10 solid years, and you're not seeing improvement in your life, there has to be a question mark somewhere. So God will always have leaders to help them, help him and his people to move forward. When God destroyed them, the younger generation were the people who had the opportunity to move into the land of Canaan, flowing with milk and honey after he destroyed the first generation who did not have enough faith in him. So they come to the land, and the same thing Brother Ian said this morning. The things God warned them against are the very things they started to indulge themselves in. They wanted to be like the people around them. They wanted to be like the other nations who had their own kings and were ruling over them. And so Samuel tells us, in first Samuel he says that the people came to Samuel, requested that they be given a king, and Samuel was displeased. But God said, do not be displeased because, like this morning, he said, these people are stiff-necked. You don't have to worry. You give them the king. The one that they had saw could not follow the dictates of God. Remember, Jeremiah 6, 13 keeps telling you and me that 
we have heard everything God you've said, but we will deal according to the dictates of our own hearts. And that's what the people done. So God chose for them a man after his own heart, David. David ruled the people. He, because he was a prophet in himself, he prophesied about so many things that were to happen. If you come to Acts chapter 2, when Peter stood up to speak to the congregation that had gathered on the day of Pentecost, he made reference to this, that David was a prophet. And for seeing these things, he prophesied about the resurrection of the Christ, who will then sit on his throne. When he had passed on and given the mantle or the throne had gone into Solomon's hands, remember David wanted to build a magnificent temple for the living God, but God said, no, you won't do that because you've shed that too many blood. But it's the man who was after God's own heart, though. You could be after God, a man after God, a woman after God's own heart, but some of your activities could prevent you from doing certain things that God would want to achieve. Solomon comes into the scene. It took like about 23 years to build that magnificent temple just to house the Ark of the Covenant of the Living God. In its beauty, the Queen of Sheba thought about all these things when she was somewhere in Ethiopia, Africa, where she thought, I will go and see for myself what this king has done. And came to see him, and in Chronicles we are told that, she said, it is the Almighty God who has given you the opportunity to sit on his throne to rule over his people. That throne does not belong to man. It's only God's, and he decides and chooses people who he wants them to be on it. But then as the people went on, divisions came. Then you have the northern kingdom, you have the southern kingdom. There we go, another problem. And then Brother Ian told us the activities. Isaiah keeps saying, you people, there's something wrong with you. Stiff-necked people, they don't want to obey the laws of God. Some have become rich, some have had enough money, so they had no regard for other people. Arrogance, there was no justice in the system. People of God had lost everything God had given to them. And there comes God says, I'm going to scatter you people. You go into slavery once more time, learn something there, and then you come back. But they had forgotten that their forefathers were slaves in Egypt, did not learn any lessons from there. It's the same thing Jesus Christ talks about. He says, as it was in the days of um, Noah, so shall it be. People were given in marriage, they married, they done all sorts of things. It's the same. These days, people are given in marriage, people get married, wedding becomes a, a big thing. How much more money we throw into all these things just to get the marriage going in? Marriage is of no substance, but the, the things around, you know, what garment you're going to wear, what dress you're going to wear, what chapel you're going to wear, who is going to do all this becomes the focus. And then after we lose the values enshrined in marriage itself. The statistics are telling, and he is very good at statistics. I'm not very good. I just look at the values and say, yeah, how much is going to cost? I'll just pay the money. <laughs> That's what I do at work, you know. Don't come and sit down with me. Have you done it? You say, yes, okay. How much is it going to cost? Okay, I look at the budget. And we can't shelve this one for now. we do that next year. But that's what happens. Sometimes we keep talking about the same things over and over and over and over. And it's like people barking, people barking. It's not that people are bargaining. It is because God places so much importance in these things. And that if we do these things well, it will benefit us. So God sends them back into slavery. Babylon takes control. Assyria comes in Babylon. They take these people into captivity. And the people were worried. Then we have false prophets who had come in there. 
talking about lots and lots of things. And God says, don't worry about those people. 70 years, you're going to be out there. So if you have some business to do in Babylon, do it. If you have to establish anything, do it. The good thing about all these things is when you start reading Daniel, Daniel was one of the young men taken into captivity. But if you go to Daniel chapter 1, it keeps telling you about what qualities that this gentleman had when they went in there. Daniel chapter 1. At chapter 1, verse 3. Then the king instructed Aspanes, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles. These are the people who had come into captivity, slavery. Young men in whom there was no blemish, but good looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. Look at the characteristics the king was looking for. Young men, people full of wisdom, ability to serve, quick to understand. Those who possess knowledge are gifted in all wisdom. The same people as you read down, verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portions of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which uh, he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the Enoch that he might not defile himself. And he says, now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the Enoch's. Qualities God is looking for wherever you and I may find ourselves. So whilst in captivity, that God wanted the people to return, he kept telling those, this is where Hagar comes in. Hagar According to Hagar's readings, you come across the fact that he had seen this beautiful, magnificent temple that was built where people could go and worship the living God. And then for all reasons from the Chaldeans, they had destroyed the temple. The temple has lost its magnificent nature. There was no magnificence to it anymore. And those who had God at heart to dream of coming back to this magnificent temple to worship him were saddened in their hearts. And so Hagar keeps talking about the fact that people need to reflect back times that you could go back and worship the living God in chapter 2 verse 1. You hear about this in Hagar 2 1. And then here you go, you have other ones in there. You have Nehemiah, you have Ezra, you have all these people who were geared up and fired up to come back. And then you come across Zerubbabel, we heard about him this morning. These were people who were preparing themselves. You know in Romans chapter 8, when it talks about all things work for good for those. Yeah, All things work for good. What sort of good are we talking about? It is God's redemptive good, not your physical good as sometimes some people misunderstand this verse to be. We think, oh yeah, when I buy a new car, that's God is being good to me. Have you seen my Nissan? Yeah, the fellow said, oh, you bought a new one. <laughs> it's the same old one, sir. That is not what is termed as God has been good to me. God has been good to me if I am part of his redemptive plan and working within those principles. 
that when everything works out good, the word to work out good is synergy. That's where we get our English word synergy from. Everything works out to be good. You get the concept when um, Joseph, you remember Joseph? You remember Joseph? Yep. His brothers, they got him, they put him in a pit. And big brother Reuben said, no, that's not good. We can't do that to our brother. We need to get him out of there. So they got him out of there. They hashed up a second plan. But well, there's a caravan going, let's sell him. They sold him. And the people took him to Egypt and took him to the slave market. Yeah? Who wants to buy this young man? He's look good looking, handsome. He's got everything that he needs. He can serve you. while well, he ends up in the king's palace. Not long after that, he ended up in prison. So this man walks from prison. He walks from pit to the caravan, goes to the palace, ends up in prison. And then many, many years later, God in his redemptive plan, protecting the seed, as we heard this morning, gives them the opportunity now. When they had seen their brother... You know what they said to the brother? Oh, before dad died, you see? Remember what I said to you yesterday? The devil uses the same tricks. They had lied to the father before. The second time they go back to the brother and lie again. Before dad died, he told us to come and apologize and seek. <laughs> no, before dad died, in 49, he brought all of them together. And told them what will happen in the last days. And that's where he said that to Judah, he said, we will do all these things before Shiloh comes. So they went back. But that was the point. He said, you guys, you meant it for evil. Genesis 50, 20. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for what? Good. To bring about this day the salvation of his own people. There's no way in the Bible you read that Joseph ever, Joseph ever complained that my brother sold me into slavery. My, due to my brother's activity, I've been to jail, I've been to prison. There's no way ever. But he said, God's redemptive good is as a result of you people what you've done. I don't have any issues with you because I knew that God was going to bring about something better of which you have become beneficiaries. So we have this thing ongoing that is ongoing for redemptive good so the people of God also prepare themselves for these things, for the return. So you've got Ezra preparing himself for the return. You've got Nehemiah preparing himself for the return. What were they doing? They were praying. They were seeking the face of God. They were fasting. In the church of Christ, you talk of fasting, everybody says, oh, fasting, oh, New Testament doesn't say. Fasting, New Testament doesn't say. How do you want to be more spiritual if you're not putting these things into practice? A whole nation, the king hears that they were in sin and instructs the people to be in Ashkelos and fast and pray to the living God. Jesus Christ says, Hey, you worried about fasting? Because the bridegroom is here, you don't worry about these things. But as soon as he leaves, think about these things. You want to be spiritual? You want to be on fire for God? It does not come by. It's not like these modern days where you do a drive through and then you want a cappuccino, you want a latte, white, flat. That's not what Christianity is about, my brothers and sisters. If we're waiting on the Lord to help with his redemptive good, that's not what it is. It's about training, listening, studying to show yourselves a proof of God as a workman who is not ashamed to divide the Bible. So you have these people. My computer is here, so I think we can turn it on. I can show you some slides. My daughter didn't speak to you, but you can have that. It's just the same 
or pinned up, and then we'll get onto that. I think I have some few slides to show you before I conclude. Um, but this is what happens. So you got all these men who were fighting and talking about going back. So Zerubbabel comes in with about 42,000 people. That takes a span of about 20 years to bring people in back to rebuild the temple of the living God. Why? Because they knew God had wanted them to come and worship in this place. God had made some promises for the future. And they were all expecting to see these things happen. So, you have this constant thing where people are fearful of God, they are mindful of God, they want to worship him, they want to do the right things. If you read Daniel 9, 2, he keeps talking about the fact He then started to look into the books of Jeremiah to see when the 70 year was all going to start and finish and end so that the people of God could be liberated and be free. They spent time <coughs> reading, educating themselves in the scriptures. To bring back the people of God to their own land to worship him. To have the freedom and ability to say, this is Yahweh. This is our almighty God. But then in there you have all these things. You remember in, um, when you go to Deuteronomy chapter um, 18, verses 18. 16 to 18 keeps talking about, and the Lord God will raise up someone like me for you. And it shall come to pass that whatever he says, we need to hear that. We need to believe that. If we do not, we will be in trouble. The issue is, you come to Isaiah and he talks about the fact that, wow, the lady or virgin shall conceive. Which is that virgin we're talking about? A virgin shall conceive. Who is this virgin? A child will be born. His name will be called Emmanuel. The kingdom will be upon his shoulders. What, what time are we talking about here? Do we know what time? Did we know which virgin? No one knew about these things. So if you look at Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 when the Lord said, and we quoted it yesterday, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. That is the seed. And I think you've heard about the seed promise, the seed promise, the seed promise, the seed promise, which is ongoing and ongoing. God had to protect the seed until the rightful time. So that's what you have in Galatians chapter 4 verse 4 when he says, at the right time. Mark chapter 1 verse 13, Jesus says, the time is right for God to act and work amongst us. Is the time right for you? Is the time right for me? So you do have this concept that God is going to do something, but the time no one really knows. So first Peter keeps, gives us emphasis. Let's go to first Peter that you might understand why the return was so important and the events leading up to the uh, return. First Peter 1.10, he says that of this salvation, of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that will come to you. Searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the suffering of the Christ and the glories that would follow to them it was revealed that, not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things which angels desire to look into. The prophets, Daniel, Hagar, Joel, you remember what Joel chapter 2, he talks about uh, in the last days the Lord will pour out his spirit. When was he talking about? 
Did he really know the exact time? No. But they constantly searched and looked into the scriptures. Do we have those kind of attitudes? To look into the scriptures constantly, study it, and use those kind of things. Or we become, and I get it when I finish preaching and say, oh, that was good. I get it. I know what you mean. But the issue is, what has this got to do with me? I bet that was good. Yes, I get it. But it's effect on your life. It's effect on my life. The import of the message on me, for you, what is it? Is it something I hear now that sounds so sweet, nice, beautiful in my ears? Tomorrow, it's all gone. They search carefully, looking into these things with hope. Why would they look into? Because in Ephesians chapter 3, we are told this is the unsearchable riches of God. God had a plan before the foundation of the world. And we call it, and our brother quoted yesterday, Daniel quoted in uh, Ephesians chapter 3, when he said, he talked about the unsearchable riches of God. I'm sorry if it will lead uh, into somebody else's sermon tomorrow, but I guess it all fits into the bigger picture, uh, and that helps me with my return business. So if you take your time, that's a return, isn't it? It all helps with it. So I have to give this one to you. So I have a look into the Ephesians chapter 3. Let's go heavily read Ephesians chapter 3, and you will love this. Verse 8, to me who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. The what? Unsearchable what? Riches of Christ. How Christ is abounding in riches when it comes to you and I, our salvation. Remember First Peter 1, 10 keeps talking about the fact that this is what? They desire to look into, even angels desire to look into these beautiful, unsearchable riches of Christ. Far bigger than the magnificent God, magnificent um, temple that we talk about, that Solomon built, costing millions and millions of dollars, I would imagine, in today's terms. <clears throat> So, he calls it the unsearchable riches of Christ. Stay with me there. And the next one says, And to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. That's a mystery. It's been hidden in God himself to the intent that now the manifold wisdom, the same thing talked about the unsearchable riches here. It's a mystery here. It is the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Jesus Christ our Lord in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Boldness, access, confidence. He says it's abundance, riches. Why riches? Because he's so rich to the extent that when he was bringing his people back to the land, they were to guard, protect, and work with him to the extent that the virgin will come out. To the extent that the virgin then could be nursed and nurtured to have a child. In Jeremiah, the Bible talks about the fact that God is going to do a new thing. God is going to recreate something on earth that has never happened. He says a woman will encompass a man. A woman will have right to trump a man to have a child. Yes? And that's why the virgin had a child without a man. Uh, this defies biology. It defies biology. 
Our biology teaches us you need a male and a female to be able to come up with a child. That's what it is. By the way, when God starts something and it's a process, it will continue on. A process, once it starts, will have an outcome. So the unsearchable riches of God, the manifold wisdom of God, all these things were hidden in Christ Jesus. All, all hidden in God himself. Why hidden in God? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6. Let's quickly go there and you might understand why I am so busy trying to let you know this. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God. Remember in Ephesians chapter 3, he talks about the manifold wisdom of God. We speak to you the manifold wisdom of God. In a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our what? For our what? Glory. Remember yesterday when I said man in the garden? We were created in the image of God, in the likeness of God. We had dominion, we had power, we had glory, we had all those. But we lost that once we fell in his presence. Sin made us lose this sin. But thanks be to God, we can regain these things through Jesus Christ. Why he calls the manifold wisdom unsearchable riches is the fact that grace, you know grace, in Romans chapter 4 verse 6 going, he says, Grace says that you have been imputed righteousness. Please, sometimes let us stop thinking that God's salvation is God does some 70% and we have to top him up with 30%. That's how some of us think. Whilst I don't believe that you once saved, always saved, I also do not believe that you partially saved and you have to do the rest with yourself. You have no business there. You couldn't do it before, and you can't do it after. In Romans chapter 7, he says that you had three laws that were affecting you. Your inner man wanted to do something which was right and good, but you were prevented by the law because the law made sin even worse in you. And then you say you got another law which is warring against this your mind. And then he said, oh, poor wretched man, who am I? I need Jesus Christ. He gives you grace. Grace is not just about forgiveness of sins. It's not just about having salvation. It is also about recovery of what you lost because of sin. You lost glory, you lost dominion. The only way you can get it all back is in Christ Jesus. That's why it's an unsearchable riches. Things you've lost, you're going to get them back. Before the ages for our glory, and then he says, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. There you go is the mystery why God had to hide these things for many, many generations. Because, now I'm going to ask you the question. If you knew about what you know now, when Pilate said, this is Jesus and this is the thief, who would you have gone for? Yeah? If you knew of this plan, if this was before you, before... Pilate, what would you have said? <laughs> would you have cited with the book, crucify him, crucify him, or just let him go? Think about it carefully. If we had known of this plan, if the devil had known of this plan, he would have thwarted the whole thing. All things work for good for those that are called according to the purpose, according to God's purpose. So, brothers and sisters in the Lord, I may not take more of your time. 
all it is is God had to bring the people back to the land to start worshiping. And I must say to you also, when you hear names like Ezra, when you hear names like Nehemiah, when you hear names like Zerubbabel, they are all contemporaries of each other. The Old Testament, for it to be seen and read as you see it now, thanks to those guys at the time, who went back, looked at the books that had been written, and made sure they wrote and canonized what we have the Old Testament. They had about 120 people who committed themselves to this process in fine detail. Go back, look at what Moses had written and everything to make sure no one else. Because remember, the northern kingdom, when they went to Samaria, you know what they started to do? Oh, don't worry, we don't need priests. Oh, no, no, we'll be okay. We'll have to worship. Yo, don't go to Jerusalem to worship. No, no, we can't. They had their own form of worship. So if they had allowed these people to have continued, we could have ended up with a perverted version of the scriptures roaming around somewhere and everybody trying to make sense out of it. I think I'm just about done. What is in this for you? What is in this for me? What is in this for you and me is this. God's unsearchable riches. Now, Ephesians chapter 1. I'll quickly take you there before I think I step down. Ephesians 1. That's how sweet the word of God is. You want to stop and you can't stop. I know I do have time constraints here. But look, bear with me, brothers and sisters. Um, so, Ephesians 1, Ephesians 1. I'm, I'm sorry if this one eats into Trevor, your next topic. Well, I'm sorry if it eats tomorrow, whatever it is. Uh, please uh, forgive me <laughs> in advance. <clears throat> hey, Ephesians 1, come with me. You may understand this better. Ephesians 1, uh, let's read quickly. Uh, chapter 1, it says, To the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Jesus Christ, Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. When he talks about unsearchable riches, spiritual blessings. This is what we talk about. Just as he chose us. Now this is why I want you to be very careful with this. Yep. Yeah? He chose us. If you like someone who keeps underlining things, you can. Verse 5. Having predestined us. You got that one? Uh, verse 6. In him we have redemption, which he made to abound towards us. In verse 8. Having made known to us. You keep hearing this, us, 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 us. Is that right? Are you following? Yes, us, us. And they keep coming. And then in verse In him also we have. This is Paul talking, yes? And then he goes on there, that we who first, verse 12, that we who first, we who did what? He's not talking of the Jews. You don't think that this is you that he's talking about. Don't just go and take the Bible and think, oh yeah, he's talking about everybody here. No. In the first part, he's talking about the Jews. Why he's talking about the Jews? In Acts chapter 3, verse 25. You remember, he said, God sent his son to bless you. As per the prophet, in first, turning away your sins. That's where the blessing comes from. All right, put your finger in Ephesians now quickly. Help you there. Uh, you might get a better understanding of what I want to uh, say before I conclude. Okay, verse 25. Acts chapter 3. You are sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our father, saying to Abraham, and in your seed, remember the seed thing we keep talking about, protection of the seed, in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. To you first, who are these? The Jews who had gathered on the day. To you Jews first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you. In what? Turning away every one of you from your iniquities. That's how God brings about blessing you. You want to be blessed? If you're not part of the congregation, 
this is a golden opportunity for you. So he talks about us, 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 us in Ephesians chapter 1 and in verse 13. Listen. In him, you also. Now he's talking about the Gentiles. In him, you also. You who were far off, in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. There you go. Unsearchable riches of God. Manifold wisdom of God. He had to protect this by bringing back his people from captivity and the prophecies that were laid down were the same things that had to happen. They did know the times. The, the prophets had to inquire and look into this and constantly do something about it. But it wasn't meant for them. It was for you and I, our time. If you want to be part of these unsearchable riches of Christ, if you're already in there and you're not fully convinced that these unsearchable riches of Christ is for you, this is about time. You looked into yourself and say, Oh God, almighty grace, let grace abound for me. Not to abound for you to continue to sin, but let the grace abound so he's able to do what it needs to do in you. If you haven't joined the congregation and your person here, that's a golden opportunity for you also to think about these things. Unsearchable riches of God, where you have grace, where you have mercy. If you do that, the almighty living God will reward you. You then begin to have spiritual blessings in Christ by turning away from your sins, turning away from your iniquities and becoming part of him. The only difficulty sometimes, brothers and sisters, is the Lord is this. And I know we as teachers, we as preachers, we keep preaching and keep preaching. Be converted and come to the church. Be converted to church. The problem that we tend to have with those kind of things. Rather than us focusing on, and this is not diminishing church, because the church is built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. So if you convert people to Jesus Christ, who is the foundation, and they have the solid to stand in there, they grow. If we keep talking about converting one to church and the person comes into church and sees brother Ian Coca misbehaving and sees brother Brett misbehaving, they lose hope. They cannot focus on Christ Jesus. Let us get people into Christ. When they are in Christ, then they are automatically in the church. Thank you for your attention.